Up in the sprawling oak, the goose egg was peeping and wobbling around its nest. Mama, mama, said the egg. I am not your mother, said the robot. The egg continued peeping and wobbling until nightfall, when the gosling inside settled down to sleep, and the egg began quiet and still. The robot was about to settle into her own kind of sleep when she heard something in the underbrush below. Roz peered down from the branches and saw weeds rustling in the moonlight. A creature was crawling past, but the creature stayed low, hiding in the darkest shadows, so that Roz couldn't see who it was. Roz wasn't the only one watching. A pair of furry ears rose up behind a log. The ears belonged to a very hungry badger. He lay in wait as the shadowy creature came closer and closer, and when the time was right, the badger pounced. You might expect a creature under attack to run for her life or to defend herself, or at the very least to scream. But when the badger pounced, this creature just rolled onto her back, stuck out her tongue, and died. Not only was she dead, she was rotten, and the badger's face twisted with disgust. Blech, what a stench! He pawed at the stinky corpse a few times and gave up. No thanks, I'd rather eat beetles, he grumbled to himself, and the badger hurried off to find a less disgusting meal. Had that mysterious creature been frightened to death? How could her body possibly rot so quickly? Roz was confused, and the robot became considerably more confused hour by hour. When the dead creature's ears began to flicker, her nose began to twitch, and she rolled onto her feet and went on her way as if nothing happened. The robot's voice called down from the tree. Are you alive or are you dead? The creature's voice hissed up from the shadows. Who's there? Why have you been watching me? What you did was unbelievable, said Ross. I could not look away. Unbelievable? Really? The creature's voice seemed to be softening. I thought perhaps I overdid it when I stuck out my tongue. I was certain you were dead. Oh, what a lovely thing to say. Were you dead? Well, of course not. Nobody can actually come back from the dead. It was just an act. I don't understand. It's simple. I knew that if I played dead and really laid on it thick, the old badger would be so disgusted he'd run off, and that's exactly what happened. We possums are natural performers, you know. Ah, so you're a possum. Roz's computer brain quickly retrieved any information it had on possums. You are a marsupial, and you are nocturnal, and you are known for mimicking the appearance and smell of dead animals when threatened. The possum said it's true. Death seems to my speciality. But I have a wide range, believe me. I believe you. Have you done any acting, said the possum? I have not, said the robot. Well, you should. You might enjoy it. You can start by imagining the character you'd like to be. How do they move and speak? What are their hopes and their fears? How do others react to them? Only when you understand truly a character can you become that character. The two odd creatures sat there, one in the tree, the other in the weeds, and talked about acting. The possum went on and on about her various <coughs> excuse me, acting methods and her triumphant performances, and our robot absorbed every word. But why do you pretend to be something you're not, said the robot? Because it's fun, said the possum, and because it helps me survive, just as you saw. You never know, it might help you survive, too. Soon, the robot's computer brain was humming with activity. Performing could be a survival strategy. If the possum could pretend to be dead, the robot could pretend to be alive. She could act less robotic and more natural. If she could pretend to be friendly, she might make some friends, and they might help her live longer and better. Yes, this was an excellent plan. Roz wasted no time, and spoke her next words in the friendliest voice that she could muster. Madam Marsupial, it would be a great honor and absolute privilege if you would kindly inform me of your name. Roz's friendly demeanor needed some work, but it was a start. Yes, of course, said the possum. My name is Pinktail, and you are? Leaves gently shook as Roz climbed down from the tree. It is a very lovely pleasure to make your acquaintance, my dear Pinktail. A moment later, the robot stepped into the moonlight. My name is Roz. Oh my, the possum gasped. You're a, 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 a monster. I am not a monster. I am a robot, and I am harmless. Harmless? Really? Well, you do seem rather gentle, and I heard someone say that you don't eat any food at all, which makes no sense, but hopefully it means you won't eat me. The robot said, I will not eat you. The possum said, I'm so glad to hear that. 
and a moment later she too stepped into the moonlight. It's nice to meet you, Roz. A weak smile appeared on Pinktail's pointy face. Roz thought things were going really well, but she didn't know what to say next. Neither did Pinktail. So the two friendly creatures just stood there together and listened to the crickets for a while. Pinktail said at last, Well, I should be on my way. Have a nice evening, Roz. Have the nicest evening, Pinktail. I shall look forward to the pleasure of encountering you again in the future. Soon, I hope. Farewell. With that awkward goodbye, Pinktail slipped back into the woods and Roz climbed back into the tree. Something was happening inside the goose egg. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, crunch. A tiny little bill poked through the eggshell, peeped once, and then continued crunching away. The hole grew bigger and bigger, and then, like a robot breaking from a crate, the hatchling pulled himself out into the world. He lay quietly in the nest, with his eyes closed, surrounded by chips of broken shell. And when his eyes slowly winked open, the first thing he saw was that robot looking back. Mama, mama, peeped the gosling. I'm not your mother, said the robot. Mama, mama. I am not your mother. Food, food. The gosling was hungry. Of course he was. And so using her friendliest voice, Ross said, What would you like to eat, little darling? Food was the only response. The hatchling was far too young to be helpful. Roz needed to find a grown goose. So she scooped up the nest and the gosling inside, placed it on her flat shoulder, and marched through the forest, searching for geese. Ordinarily, the forest animals would have run away from the monster, but they were awfully curious why she was carrying a hatchling on her shoulder. And once Roz explained the situation, the animals actually tried to help. A frog pointed Roz up to the squirrels. A squirrel recommended she speak to the magpies, and the magpies sent them over to the beaver pond. The ground grew soggier, the grass grew taller, and soon the robot and the gosling were looking across a wide, murky pond. Dragonflies buzzed through the reeds. Turtles sunned themselves on a log. Schools of small fish gathered in the shadows, and there, floating in the center of the pond, was an old gray goose. A very good morning to you, the robot's friendly voice boomed over the water. I have an adorable little gosling with me. The goose just stared. I am in great need of your assistance, said Ross. Actually, the gosling is in need of your assistance. The goose didn't move. Food, peeped the gosling. Food, food. That tiny voice was more than the old goose could bear, and she began gliding across the pond, squawking to the robot. What are you doing with that hungry hatchling? Where are his parents? There was a terrible accident, said Ross. It was my fault. This gosling is the only survival. If there was a terrible accident, then why does your voice sound so cheerful? The goose flapped her wings. Are you sure you didn't eat his parents? Roz returned to her normal voice. I am sure I did not eat his parents. I did not eat anything. I do not eat anything, including parents. The goose squinted at the robot, and then she said, Do you know where his parents were? I do not know. Well, they must have belonged to one of the older flocks, because nobody in my flock is missing. Will you take the goslin? I most certainly will not, squawked the goose. I can't take in every orphan I see. You say this is your fault. It means that it's up to you to make things right. Mama, mama, peeped the gosling. I have tried to tell him that I am not his mother, said the robot, but he does not understand. Well, you'll have to act like his mother if you want him to survive. There was that word again, act. Very slowly, the robot was learning to act friendly. Maybe she could learn to act motherly as well. The goose said, you do want him to survive, don't you? Yes, I want him to survive, said the robot, but I do not know how to act like a mother. Oh, it's nothing. You just have to provide the gosling with food and water and shelter and make him feel loved, but don't pamper him too much. Keep him away from danger and make sure he learns to walk and talk and swim and fly and get along with the others and look after himself. And that's really all there is to motherhood. The robot just stared. Mama, food, said the gosling. Now would probably be a good time to feed your son, said the goose. Yes, of course. What should I feed him, said the robot. Give him some mashed up grass. And if a few insects get in there, all the better. Ross tore several plates of grass from the ground. She mashed them into a ball and then dropped the ball into the nest. The gosling shook his tail feathers and chewed his very first bites of food. 
By the way, my name is Loudwings, said the goose. Everyone here knows your name, Roth. But what's the gosling's name? I don't know. The Roth, the robot, looked at her adopted son. What is your name, gosling? Loudwings squawked. He can't name himself. And then, with a loud burst of wing beats, the goose fluttered up from the pond and landed right on Roz's head. Water streamed down the, bo- the robot's body, dusty body, as Loudwing leaned over the nest. Loudwing said, Oh dear, he certainly is a tiny thing. He must be a runt. I'll warn you, Roz, runts usually don't last very long. And with you for a mother, it'll take a miracle for him to survive. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. However... The gosling still deserves a name. Let's see here. His bill is an unusually bright color. It's actually quite lovely. If I were his mother, I might call him Bright Bill. But you're his mother, so it'll be up to you. His name will be Bright Bill, said Roz, as the goose fluttered back to the water. And we will live by this pond where he can be around other geese. I will find us a sturdy tree nearby. You will do no such thing, the goose flapped her wings. A tree is no place for a gosling. Bright Bill needs to live on the ground like normal geese. Loudwing sized up the robot. I suppose you two will need a rather large home. You better speak with Mr. Beaver. He can build you anything. He's a little gruff at times, but if you're extra friendly, I'm sure he'll help you out. And if he gives you trouble, remind him that he owes me a favor. Every day, the beavers swam along their dam, inspecting and repairing it. A wall of wood and mud allowed only a trickle of water to pass through, and it had turned a narrow stream into a wide pond that many animals now called home. As Roz and Brightbill walked around the pond, they passed hundreds of chewed-up tree stumps, proof that the beavers needed a constant supply of wood, and this gave Roz an idea. The robot swung her flattened hand, and the sounds of chopping wood echoed across the water, They were soon replaced by the sounds of footsteps and shaking leaves as the robot carefully walked along the beaver dam with a gosling on her shoulder and a freshly cut tree in her hands. The beavers floated along their lodge and stared at the bizarre sight with open mouths until Mr. Beaver slapped his broad tail in the water, which meant, Stop right there. The robot stopped. Hello, beavers. My name is Roz, and this is Bright Bill. Please do not be frightened. I am not dangerous. She held out the tree. I have brought you a gift. I thought perhaps you could use this in your beautiful dam. No thanks, said Mr. Beaver. I have a strict policy never to accept gifts from monster. Don't be ridiculous, interrupted Mrs. Beaver. We can't let a perfectly good birch go to waste. I'm afraid I must insist, said Mr. Beaver. Mrs. Beaver turned to her husband. Remember how you asked me to point out when you're being stubborn and rude? Well, you're being stubborn and rude. Then she turned back to Roz. Thank you, monster. If you'd be so kind as to drop the tree in the water, we'll take it from here. I'm not a monster. Roz tossed the tree like a twig. I am a robot. The tree smacked against the water and sent the beavers bobbling up and down. Just then, Bright Bill started peeping. Mama, hungry. So Roz dropped a ball of grass into the nest. The gosling thinks you are his mother, came a quiet voice. It was Paddler. Mr. and Mrs. Beaver's son. His real mother is dead, said Ross, so I have adopted him. There was a brief silence, and then Paddler looked up at Ross and said, You're a very good robot to take care of Bright Bill. Mr. Beaver sighed. Yes, yes, it's very good of you, Ross, but I don't understand what any of this has to do with us. My son and I need a home, and Loudwing said you could help us build one. Of course she did, Mr. Beaver muttered to himself. Loudwing gets me out of one lousy jam, and I spend the rest of my days doing her favors. Mrs. Beaver glared at her husband. Sorry, he said, realizing he was being stubborn and rude again. Stay right there, Roz. We need to have a family meeting. The three beavers slipped under the water, and a moment later their muffled muffled voices could be heard heard inside the lodge. The robot stood on the dam and patiently waited for her son. Mama, Mama. Yes, Bright Bill, I'm trying to act like a good mother. A ripple and Mr. Beaver's head appeared above the water. If you bring us four more trees, good healthy ones, maybe I'll help you and the gosling. This is wonderful, said the robot. We will be right back. 
I've built my fair share of lodges over the years, Mr. Beaver stood at the water's edge, but I can't say I've ever built one for a robot in a gosling. So just what exactly do you need? Well, said Roz, we need a lodge big enough for us both. It should be comfortable and safe, and it should be near the pond. How long do you plan on living in this lodge? I don't know. Well, then we better make sure it's strong and sturdy. Mr. Beaver stroked his whiskers as he thought. Do you plan on having friends over? The misuse, the missus loves to entertain guests. I don't have any friends. No friends? Well, you seem pretty likable for a monster. I mean, for a robot. But if you want my advice, you could grow yourself a garden. Your neighbors won't be able to resist fresh herbs and berries and flowers. Just you wait and see. So make sure there's a place for a garden. And we'll give your lodge some extra space for all the friends you'll be hosting. The beaver winked. We also need to find a way to keep your lodge comfortable when it's cold outside. Our lodge is heated by our own bodies, but I think we'll have to find another way to heat yours. The beaver and the robot thought about heat for a while. The first thing that came to Roz's mind was the sun. But she remembered the hot sparks she felt when sliding down the mountain peak. She said, I could heat our lodge with fire. Mr. Beaver blinked his little eyes. I will need to experiment, but I will think, and I think that there is a way. You go ahead, right ahead, Roz, said the beaver. But would you please not try to burn down the entire forest? Do not worry, I will be careful. Let's move on, Mr. Beaver sighed. The next order of business is to find a site for your lodge. That meadow across the water would be perfect, but the hares will live to fit if you try to build there. I think we should clear out some trees and build right in the forest, and I know just the place. The beaver took them along the water and up a dense section of forest that jutted into the pond. It needs some work, said Mr. Beaver, trudging through the thick woods, but this ought to do the job. Yes, this ought to do the job, said Ross in her friendly voice. Job, said Bright Bill. Mr. Beaver was incredibly skilled at taking down trees, but even he could not keep up with Ross's powerful chopping hands, and so he let the robot do the hard work. He pointed out the trees and the shrubs that needed to go, and Roz started hacking away. By sunset, they were standing in a newly cleared site, and they had more than enough wood to build their lodge. Mr. Beaver yawned. Oh, you did some fine work today, Roz. I'll return in the morning, and we'll pick up right where we left off. The robot said, what would you like me to do? Tonight? So you still feel like working, do you? Very well. Well... You can start by digging out those tree stumps, and you can collect all those large, flat stones over there, and you can smooth down this patch of dirt so we'll have a level place to build. That should keep you busy. The next morning, Mr. Beaver returned to find that Ross had been very busy indeed. All the tree stumps had been dug up. All of their holes had been filled with dirt. Twenty large stones had been stacked, and the ground was now perfectly level. But what most astonished Mr. Beaver was that Ross and Brightbill were huddled around a small crackling campfire. Mr. Beaver moved his lips, but no words came out. Bright Bill was cold last night, said Roz, so I taught myself how to make a fire. But, but, but how? I discovered when I strike these two stones together, they create sparks like this, and I directed the sparks onto dry leaves and wood until they ignited, and once I had a fire, it was easy to keep it going, and if I need to put it out, I just add water. Mr. Beaver sat and warmed his paws. I've never seen a, a fire in such a neat little bundle. He stared into the flames. I've only seen it blazing through the forest, burning everything in the path. But this is marvelous. It took another minute to enjoy the warmth, and then he and the robot got back to work. Mr. Beaver asked Ross to dig a trench here, to place large stones there, to arrange a log this way, to smear mud that way. Birds and squirrels perched in the trees and watched the new lodge take shape. It resembled a beaver lodge, but it was larger, a great dome of wood and mud and leaves. A simple opening in the wall served as the entrance, and the door was nothing more than a heavy stone that the robot could slide out of the way. Inside the lodge was one big room. The arched ceiling was high enough that Roz could stand upright. A fire pit was set into the center of the floor, and a mesh of thin branches acted as a vent. Long stones lined the interior walls, like benches, and were covered with thick cushions of moss. There was even a hole for storing food and water for Brightbill. You've got yourself a beautiful pond-viewing party, said Mr. Beaver. What are you going to name this property? I do not understand. Why, a beautiful lodge like this deserves a name. We call our lodge Streamcatcher. The robot's computer brain didn't take long. 
The lodge is for Bright Bill. Bright Bill is a bird. Birds live in nests, so could we call this lodge the nest? Huzzah, squeaked the beaver. The nest is a fine name for this lodge. Nest, nest, laughed Bright Bill. They stood outside the nest and admired their handiwork until Mr. Beaver's belly began to grumble. That sound means it's time for me to go to dinner. Thank you very much for your help, said Roz. We could not have done it without you. You're quite welcome, said Mr. Beaver, smiling. For your garden, you want to speak with Tawny, the doe who lives over the hill. She'll know just what to do. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have to hurry home before Paddler eats all the best leaves. Enjoy your first night in the nest.